Who has, uh, who's heard of uh, Top Gun, the movie Top Gun? Anybody in here? Okay, has, has anybody seen it? Okay, you, you probably know Top Gun really was a, a Navy squadron where they trained aviators. I was a Top Gun instructor. And what I'm going to, and, uh, and it was also it was a movie, it came out in 1986. I helped them to make the movie. So I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is, is uh, f spend my time talking about, um, about some of the photos that I took during my uh, 20 years in the Navy. And that'll take about 10 minutes. And then I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes talking about how you can ensure a secure retirement through smart investing. Okay? Is that what everybody really wants to hear? Okay. So. No, I'm, I'm not the guy to tell you how to do that either. Okay, so this, uh, I started out in uh, Pensacola. That's me in, the, uh, in front of the TA-4 Skyhawk. Then I uh, flew F-14s. I got involved in the movie Top Gun, and I'll talk about my uh, books at the end. Next slide, please. So this briefly uh, summarizes my career. Uh, I was in the Navy for 20 years. For me, the, uh, the dream to uh, fly jets started when I was about 10 years old. Uh, I don't know exactly what, what precipitated that, but that's just when I remember it. I wanted to be a fighter pilot, but when I was in college, my eyesight went bad. I had to wear glasses. You can't be a, a fighter pilot in the, in the U.S. forces unless you have 20-20 vision, so I had to be a backseater. Luckily, the Navy was introducing the F-14 Tomcat, and the guy in the back could wear glasses. So I said, you know what? Uh, and actually, I knew people that said, well, if I can't be a pilot, I don't want any part of it. And I thought the opposite way. I say, I'd rather be in the back seat of that F-14 than anything else in the world. So the other thing is that being a backseater is just about as competitive in terms of getting there as being a pilot. You know, there are, uh, and, it, and a lot of it also depends on when you come in the Navy. Uh, so I, I uh, as soon as I graduated from college in 1979, I went to Pensacola, started my training. Um, and we had to select, you know, what plane you want to fly and, and all that stuff. So it was still very competitive and very challenging, but uh, I got good training. I was really committed to succeeding, and I ended up getting selected for going in uh, F-14s. So let's see if I can uh, take this off and it still works. Okay, good. Because I feel like I'm chained to this desk here. Okay, so this uh, 20 years on the left talks about my career, training command, then uh, my first F-14 squadron, VF-24, Top Gun as an instructor, then uh, VF-2, uh, back to F-14s, so then six years as a staff officer, back to VF-211 as commanding officer, and then a final uh, final tour as a... As a uh, ship's company. Uh, this picture was uh, me when I was briefing a uh, Top Gun class flight. Uh, at that time, I was about 27 years old. The, uh, the level of effort that it took to be an instructor, to qualify as an instructor, and to, to give lectures and to brief flights, it was, uh, it was extremely demanding. But uh, the other instructors, they would do whatever they needed to do to help you but they also ensured that you met the standards. So it was, for me, it was just an incredible experience and incredible organization to be a part of uh, all these years. Okay, so for the rest of the evening, I'm gonna go through the pictures kind of quickly. I'm not gonna tell you a lot more about my career or anything, but if you got any questions, just interrupt me and, uh, and, and I'll answer your questions and that'll tell me what your interest is. So Suresh, I've got uh, three hours, right? Three hours to cover? Okay, thanks. <laughs> Next slide. Since this is a photo group, uh, and I'm not just saying this because I'm outnumbered, I'm saying this because I'm sincere. Just from my exposure to your group tonight, I'm amazed. You guys got a great crowd here, uh, and I, and I uh, applaud your commitment and your enthusiasm, so, so very nice. But, I prepared this slide for tonight. My very first camera that I took in the airplane was a Nikon that I borrowed from a squadron member. And it was something that he had bought in Vietnam. So it was a big old clunky Nikon, but it did have a built-in meter. 
the first camera that I bought was a Konica FS1. Anybody ever use a Konica? Konica? No Konica users, okay. I used it because it had an, a built-in auto winder. And that was my main, uh, and I was familiar with it from using one in college. Then I later got a Konica FT1, and then in my final tour, I used a, uh, my own Nikon N50. All uh, film, slide film and print film. That's all I shot. Uh, there were no, I finished my flying tours in 1998. They didn't, we didn't have good digital cameras in. Uh, I shot a little bit of video. It, it's not that good. It's hard to shoot good video, and there were no GoPros back then either. So I was a film guy. Next. Okay, being a Rio, in the F-14, there were no flight controls in the back. So the pilot up front is flying with stick, throttles, rudders. He's flying the plane. Guy in the back, I, had, uh, I did some co-pilot duties. I operated the radar and things like that. This was uh, one of my earlier selfies. Uh, I kind of like this. We didn't call them selfies. We, we used to call them face shots. But in the early 80s, there were a few of us. I mean, if you look online, you can see there's old pilots taking uh, selfies way back, you know, in the 70s and stuff. So this was probably shot with a 50 millimeter lens, just, just throwing the camera up there and taking the picture. Next. Being a Rio meant that, uh, being in a Navy fighter squadron meant that you traveled a lot. This was a typical deployment. Um, USS Constellation in the early 1980s, leave San Diego, go to the Pacific, go over the Arabian Sea, visit some cities, and then go home. Lasted seven and a half months. In my 20 year career, I did five of these deployments. Um, two of them were seven and a half months, three of them were six months. When you're a single guy and you're just out visiting around the world, it was exciting. Got some Navy people in here, I know. It's a lot of fun. But, you know, if you're a married guy and as you get older and you have, you know, a comfortable house and everything, it's, it's pretty demanding to go on a deployment for six or seven months in peacetime. But, you know, there, there were some advantages to it. Uh, one thing was that we did all kinds of great, cool, real-world flying. So this is a picture I took of a missile shoot. We shot missiles uh, in the United States and we shot them uh, deployed. That's just an AIM-9 Sidewinder. And uh, you know, I, I wasn't like the, the super missile shoot recording guy. I was just, we were shooting a missile, I just snapped that picture. We also aerial refueled. We refueled on almost every flight from the carrier. Um, and the reason we did it so often because it was a perishable skill. Many, Many times we would use our own uh, organic uh, refueling airplanes, either uh, back then it was KA-6s, S-3s, A-7s, and that's an Air Force uh, KC-10. Of course, we uh, did a lot of carrier operations, plenty of opportunities for uh, dramatic scenes and pictures, um, and the challenge was capturing the, capturing the scene. Um, I, I had people tell me, you know, take a bunch of pictures, but when I look at my slides and I look at my collection, if I saw something, I would usually take one picture and go, oh yeah, look at that, click, you know, put my camera back away. Uh, and then we also escorted uh, Soviet airplanes. They'd come out to look at the aircraft carrier. Uh, we, as I was a Pacific Fleet guy. We escorted mostly uh, bears and maize. Every once in a while, you see something a little bit more interesting. It's just kind of fun to see the enemy, you know, back then. Because in the Cold War, they were the enemy. They, they, would, they would sometimes try to get you to slow down, turn into you, make you lose control or something like that. So, you know, they were, they were bad guys. Uh, but when we were flying next to them, we just didn't let ourselves get in trouble. We just waved to them and, and kept it friendly, you know. Wow. Aircraft, most, most of my experience was F-14A Tomcat. This picture was taken in uh, 1981 at NAS Miramar. I went up on the, the top of the hangar on a Friday afternoon and took these pictures. And I'd go, oh, that, that turned out pretty good. So that's most of our squadron lined up. Next. Um, during my career, I, I went on very few Photo X flights. Almost all the pictures that I took were uh, during the course of a mission. But in the 80s, we had uh, free time a lot, so we could say, hey, let's take this picture, let's set up and do this picture. And so, you know, I had a couple of minutes to take snapshots. Uh, this picture right here, I just, 
I mean, I, I took this in 1981 also. I just pointed the camera and shot, but in years later when I was looking at the pictures, I just loved the clouds part of it. And then most of the time, though, I tried to get nice and close to the airplane. But this one, I, I'm glad I had a lot of clouds and stuff. Uh, that other one, uh, the F-14, in my opinion, it looked good from a lot of angles. But if you weren't careful, the worst angle was if the wings were out and you were at the, at the wing uh, looking directly sideways from the guy, especially if you're shooting wide angle, the wing looked big and ugly. And I was going to put a picture of that in my collection tonight, but I knew it was after dinner. I didn't want to make anybody sick, so no, no ugly pictures, but uh, some failed pictures. This one, any idea how... How I might have taken this picture? You were in a MiG-28. I was inverted in a MiG-28. Very good. Okay, I walked into that one. This was upside down. This was taken when we were doing formation aerobatics. And, so, and, I, and I was just watching. This was my wingman. So he was over my shoulder. I was just watching him. And when he got out of position. He was supposed to stay, you know, below, and we rolled like this. He, when we were inverted, he got out of position. He came up above our wing line. I snapped a picture. And then, and then when I got it, I go, wait a minute. It looks a lot better if you flip it upside down. So that was unintentional. happy with it. Oh, has anybody done air-to-air uh, -air out of a, a sky van or a C-130 or something like that? You've done that? Oh, yeah, 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 you've done it. Okay, so you've done a little bit of that. I got to go on one flight. It, it was, what's that? You, did, who does that? Oh, who does that? All the time, yeah. <laughs> All the time, right, okay. Uh, when we were on deployment in 19, about 1989, one of our lieutenants asked the, uh, the C2 squadron if they would take us up and open the ramp and let us take pictures. And so he set it up for me to go, me and another guy from my squadron, and then some E2 guys. So the first, the E2 came up, I let the E2 guys go to the front, and then I hung back and I snapped that picture of the, of the whole setup. And then he left, and they, they let us F-14 guys get up, and our F-14 came up. Now, we, we had arranged a clean, high-visibility F-14 loaded with weapons to come up and get our picture taken. And then we had a backup. And both of those planes went down on deck. And so we got this low visibility guy with not a single weapon on him. But that's what showed up. OK, if you ever get the chance to do this, do it. Because you, one, it's not scary. I wasn't scared at all. It's sitting on the ramp, you know, and you look out, and there's 5,000 feet of nothing below you. But you know, it's like, whatever. You make your mind up, you're going to do this. But to see this. 30 ton machine just hanging in the air right behind you. I mean, he was close. And I'm sitting there waving to the pilot. I'm going like this, you know, up a little. I mean, I was just telling him, you know, down a little and stuff. And uh, it's just surreal to see this thing flying behind you. So it was very cool. Next slide. Then uh, I, I was a Top Gun instructor. And so we would uh, fly back and forth to the operating areas and we, you know, snap pictures uh, sometimes. I mean, for me, it was, I never wanted my camera to get in the way of doing the mission, especially at Top Gun. Because, I mean, the other instructors, you know, everybody likes to get their picture taken and likes airplane pictures. But our reputation and our performance was, the, was primary. And, and me, I was an instructor, that was my primary also. But still, yes, Rish. That's a 50 millimeter lens? That is, uh, yes, that's, let's see, at that time, I was probably using a, uh, 35 to 105 zoom. And so he asked what, what lens was I using? So that was probably about a 50 millimeter. I, I would. Uh, so they're all pretty damn close. They are pretty close. Uh, I got to tell you, so he asked, he commented that the jets are close. These F5s, they were very stable and we would fly them very close together uh, when we were taking a picture. So what we did was. Uh, I told him, you know, I just came up on the radio, said I'm going to get a couple of shots, snaps, you know. So we just rolled over the top of them. I mean, they tightened up their formation. We rolled over the top. I took a picture, and that's it, you know. And so, yeah, it turned out pretty good. This is a, an A4E 
F5E, F5F. That's what Top Gun used as adversaries back then. And then I happened to be there when they were filming the movie, and so we painted some F5s uh, black as MiG-28s, and actually Paramount did that. Um, they painted uh, uh, three one, F5Es and one two-seat F5F. And so uh, the 16 instructors that were Top Gun instructors at the time, we took turns flying the jets and supporting the movie. And this was uh, Clay Lacey's Learjet, which had uh, cameras on it. So, and that was, f flying to film the movie was, was amusing. I mean, it wasn't nearly as demanding as regular Top Gun class flights, but it was a different kind of flying. They wanted us to fly real close together and all kinds of other stuff, so it was kind of fun, so. Yeah, I, I, some of the pictures in the movie is me. I am pretty sure that in the inverted picture where they're communicating, uh -huh. I'm in that F5F. I'm the backseater in that airplane. Seriously? Yeah, because we would fly next, if, to film that, we uh, flew up beside the Learjet, and they said, uh, okay, when I count to three, look up like you're startled. So we're flying along beside the Learjet, just stabilized, and the director goes, one, two, three, and we just looked up. And there was nothing above us. They, they had tried to film the scene for real, uh, but they could not do it because they just couldn't stabilize the airplanes close enough. So they, they just had us flying like that. We looked up, and then they did that in post-production special effects. And then I went up to Paramount for two days after they filmed it, and I helped the... Uh, a, a pilot and I went up there, and uh, we helped them to cut the film together and to, to come up with all the dialogue, because what they had was they had 20-some uh, minutes of film, and this one thing that I remember was they, they showed a, a plane going up in a loop like this, and the next scene was coming down like this. And this pilot and I look at him and we go, uh, if you go up like this, you're gonna come down like that. And the, the editor, the film editor goes, Oh, <laughs> and so, I mean, but that's what they took us up there for, you know. The, these guys were very professional and very capable, but, you know, there's certain things, that's why they had us. So they showed us how to use this film editing machine, how to make marks and all that, and, and we, it was actually kind of fun. It, it was a lot of fun. Next slide. So something else, uh, I've been looking through your, your pictures on uh, Facebook, and I see you know, in preparation to come in here. And I see the, uh, the interesting markings, the livery. Uh, is that it, livery? I, I, we just didn't, I didn't say that. What's that? Livery, either one. Well, I mean, it was the same, it was the same for us. And, and one thing about this picture is the squadron was in transition from an old tail design to a new tail design. Uh, that was one reason why I like this picture. Another is just I like the clouds and the lighting. And then also we were actually carrying Phoenix missiles, which we did not carry that much, but we carried them sometimes. And it just adds an element of interest. Next slide. Then this picture was taken off Key West. I was talking to some guys earlier about going to Key West. Uh, this was in Key West in 1998, and I was the CO of the squadron. And I, we had, a, uh, we had a, a very talented sailor who painted, who made stencils to paint. This was the squadron logo character. And I had him paint that on the uh, tail. Now, by the late 80s and early 90s, the Navy was, was going to low visibility markings. And so they said you can only paint, uh, by the 90s, you can only paint one jet in color. So I had him paint that on my jet. And then the, when I finished my command tour, the guy who came after me, hated, he hated that tail design, so he changed it as soon as, uh, as, soon as I left. So I was whatever. <laughs> okay, next. And again, uh, Top Gun. When I was at Top Gun, uh, we had about, uh, let's say I counted them up, about 12 or 15 different airplanes between F5s and A4s. And I, as I recall, the instructors would just, I mean, there was one officer who was responsible for managing these, but if an instructor saw a cool paint job, he would just say, hey, here's a picture of a cool paint job. Next time you repaint, make it look like this. Very informal, which, which was cool. 
And so these were just, they just painted them differently just so the class, you know, would have something to look at different and all that. There was no science, you know, about which one's most visible or whatever. But they made good pictures. Next. So one thing about flying the F-14, and, and I will quit in time to, uh, to answer questions also. And like I said, if you want me to slow down or you want to have, ask other questions, just uh, interrupt me. But the F-14 had awesome afterburners. Uh, but the thing was, they were, you could see them at night. You couldn't see them during the, uh, on pure sunlight. And the other thing was, on the carrier, when you're waiting, you're behind this guy, it was, it was so loud that, I mean, that the pain, I still remember it. We would sit there, I, I would crush my helmet to try to make it quieter. It was very painful. Next slide. So one of my things became trying to, cap, trying to get um, afterburner pictures. So this was one of the first that I took in the air, and, and I thought it was kind of dark. I mean, excuse me, I, I, I waited till late in the day, and I just happened, you know, that's when we were flying. And you can just see the, the cone of flame back there, but I was disappointed. That's not what I was looking for. It's just not dramatic enough. So some of my squadron mates knew that I was taking afterburner pictures. So one night I'm flying, and, and CJ, I still remember this guy, he goes, hey, Bio, look at this. So he lights his afterburners, you know, and, but he's like a 1,000 feet away. So he lights his burners, rolls up. So I just snapped, you know, a picture. It's not that bad. Gives you, that's kind of what it looks like. I mean, that's, that is what it looks like. And when I, when I process this, because this was a slide, you got to be careful because it wants to, you know, make it real light and make all the colors. And I'm going, well, that's not what it looked like. This is about what it looked like. It was, you know, subdued. So then I was thinking about it, and the, this guy right here, the pilot, he was a photographer also. And so when I was flying at night with him, I said, I mean, in, on his wing, and I told, talked to my pilot, I said, hey, well, I'm going to take my flash, my strobe, and try to take an afterburner picture using the strobe. So I, I tried to estimate our distance and manually, sit. anyway, that's what came out, and I go, okay, that's, <laughs> that's not that successful. But, so, yes? Oh, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. When I took these pictures, where were they developed? Now, some of my contemporaries sent their, let, uh, gave the, their pictures to the ship's photo lab. Okay. But I never did that. I mean, I, I probably did that with one or two rolls my entire career. I wanted to know if you had done them, like if you developed yourself. I used mailers. I mailed them back from the Indian Ocean. They took 10 days to get back, a few days to get developed, and then 10 days to get back to us. So. Because of the subject matter, were you allowed to show, like, could it be shown to the public? Okay, because of the subject matter, could it be shown to the public? Yeah. There were a few pictures back then uh, where we were told, do not take a camera on this flight, okay? And I'm not going to tell you what that is, but... There was also, there was a base, uh, China Lake. And, and my buddies that knew that I took pictures, they said, Bio, do not pull your camera out of the cockpit when we land at China Lake because the security will come out and take your film out. So there were a few places in China Lake, there's a lot of cool stuff going on there. So there were a few places where you could not take pictures. But most of what we did was uh, routine and yeah, not classified. And then... Just one second. And then uh, when I was later in my squadron, there were people were talking about, uh, when I, we were flying uh, patrols over Iraq, people were saying, well, you're showing what our loadout is. And I go, look, we've been doing these patrols. You know, the United States has been doing these patrols for eight years now, and the loadout's the same, and guys have been taking pictures. So, you know, I'm not the guy who's letting the secret out. So, yes. No, I, he said, was the pilot C.J. Heatley? No, oh, this, this was a different C.J. C.J. Heatley is a, he's an excellent photographer. And C.J. Heatley, Tom Toomey, and a few other guys, 
they were they were a different level photographer than I was. They were a little bit more serious about it. And they got great results though. Okay. So finally, finally, I got the picture that I wanted. And this was using this was using probably ASA 800 or 1000 color print film. <coughs> And I, I saw it in the Navy Exchange in the Philippines. I bought a roll. And then just a few days later, uh, we were flying. And, and we took off right at sunset. And so I was going, oh, the lighting's going to be just right. So this turned out. And I actually, I love the grain. I just, I like a lot of things about this. So I was very happy when I saw this picture. So that's off the coast of Vietnam. And when we took this picture, we... We used more film, I mean more, more I, we used more fuel than we planned, and so luckily nothing happened and we had to, we got away with it. Okay. Next slide. So now we will talk about selfies. Or not. Okay, so I've got this picture right here. This is really a good one. And <laughs> oh well. You know, if, if you had to get stuck on one picture, this would be the one. Yes, what are you going to say? I have a question. Um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about you know, my Navy experience and my knowledge of the 14. You talked uh, about the Phoenix. Yeah. And that was something that we were very much into learning about because you know, we were always focused on the Soviets, but I wanted to learn about our equipment. And operationally, uh, were you guys ever full load of the Phoenixes, or did you just carry? Okay, so Joe was. <coughs> Joe and I talked earlier. He was an uh, electronic technician, electronic warfare. electronic warfare guy in the Navy, and he's asking me, "Did we carry Phoenix?" And the the main problem with the Phoenix is it weighed one thousand pounds each missile, and so that affected your uh, the fuel that you have when you come back to land, and. So one of the things that the F-14 had was it had a pretty good fuel capability. It had a, a better than the F-4 fuel capability, but still it wasn't limited. I mean, you had to manage it very carefully. And so we, we would want to come back with, to the carrier with a lot of fuel in case like somebody blew a tire or there was you know, a problem. Bottom line is we would rarely carry, when we were deployed on the carrier, we would rarely carry uh, even two Phoenix. We usually carried one or none, th just because of the weight. Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't the ability of the plane to carry it or any of that. It was just because it cut into your, uh, your landing fuel. If you're, landing, if, you're, uh, if you're going out to save the carrier from a, you know, if it was wartime and you're expecting a raid of bombers, well, you're probably gonna shoot your Phoenix, so go ahead and take off with them and, and shoot them. And if you don't shoot them, you know, then, uh, then when you come back, you, you either have to land with low fuel or get rid of a few Phoenix or something like that. Is this gonna work? Are we gonna? We had a reboot, so keep okay. questions. Yes. Where are these planes today? Um, where are these airplanes today? Most Tomcats are, have been destroyed. Um, of, a pretty fair number. Iran is still flying a few dozen, maybe. A fair number of Tomcats have been lost in crashes. But a, a lot of them, uh, there's a pretty good number on display around the United States. There's only, uh, I think I saw on Facebook, there's nine of them out at the Boneyard in uh, Arizona. But, but they destroyed most of them rather than keeping them. And the reason is that various agents, and this has been going on for decades, people are, Iran gets into a case where they need some specific part and they will pay somebody to steal it. And so I've talked to people who, uh, who are associated with Tomcats on display at museums and they said that every once in a while some Navy guys come by and they'll take something off the airplane and they'll go, we heard that, that this is a sensitive part so they take it off just to keep it out of the enemy's hands. Anyway, bottom line, the, the Navy retired the Tomcat in 2006. And, and it's not coming back. Yes? Completely off the subject. 
Okay, completely off the subject. You're a retired officer living in Jacksonville, so you have access to NAS Jacksonville, so you go there to the exchange. Whatever became of the Miami Dade Airport? Did it become a St. John's River? Okay, I'm a retired officer living in Jacksonville. What happened to the Miami Air 737? First off, I was born in Jacksonville, but these days I live in Satellite Beach, so even closer. And second off, I remember that incident, but I don't have any idea what they did with that airplane. That is a good question, though, especially for you guys. You know, I mean, yeah, I, I really don't know. Um, I guarantee you somebody in Jacksonville knows. <laughs> Yes. Well, this is a question. Suresh. The, pros the prospect of Iranian F 14s you know, in combat with the Navy, given the current situation, do you have any thoughts about it? Yeah, uh, yeah. he asked, with, What are my thoughts about the prospect of Iranian F 14s uh, flying in combat against the U.S. Navy, given the current tension? And it's like, Shoot them down, man. <laughs> they're, they're on the wrong side. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I. You know, uh, that's not the first time that, you know, I mean, that it, that's not the first time in history that uh, that a good airplane has been flown by an enemy, you know, or something. But anyway, I don't, I wouldn't have any, I don't have any sympathy for the airplane because they're on the wrong side. It's too bad. Didn't their airplanes get inferior Okay, so Joe asked, were the Iranian airplanes, did the Iranian airplanes have inferior avionics or something? Uh, I've heard a lot of talk about that. I have no direct knowledge of that, so I can't say yes or no. Just wink. Yes. Compared to an F-22, yes. What's that? Compared to an F-22, the answer is yes. Well, yeah, that's not the question. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, the F-20, okay. You, you got to remember when the F-14 was designed and, and built. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Oh, as a former Rio, do I think it was a mistake to get rid of the Rios in the Navy? The, the reason that the F-14 had a Rio is, was largely because, uh, one, one, one was because it had that carrier air defense mission. And if it was doing that, facing a, a big raid by Soviet bombers with jammers and stuff, they could not automate the radar to handle that. So they wanted a guy who could focus on that. But, but a lot of people, and this is one of my, this is one of the things that bugs me, is when people claim the F-14 was designed as an interceptor. It was not. It was, it was designed as a fighter, okay? It had to be the air defense interceptor, but it was the Navy's fighter. It incorporated all the lessons from Vietnam that they could incorporate. It had a built-in gun. It had excellent maneuverability when it was brand new. And so the Navy wanted that second pair of eyeballs based on the Navy's phantom experience in Vietnam. So now the Navy has uh, three quarters of the squadrons of Super Hornets are single seat, and then there's a two seat squadron. So one out of four squadrons have two seats. And it's, it's a different world. Training, training is better. I'm well aware of the F-15's incredible, you know, kill ratio, and most of those are from single-seat airplanes. So, you know, I think there's a place where you do want a second guy in the airplane, um, but, you know, right now it seems like we're getting along, they're doing fine without him in a lot of missions. But I, I think it's, I think the Navy's doing, um, doing well to have some two-seat squadrons and some single-seat squadrons. Uh, I'll also tell you something else, and, and I can't say too much more about this, but this exact topic is, is a live discussion in the Navy right now. And I just heard guys talking about it. Uh, I'm not part of the discussion because I'm a retired guy. but So not a simple question. Thank you. Yes. Two questions. Yes. Okay, can the F-14 be flown pilot only? Uh, all of the standard F-14s could not be flown pilot only, but the reason was pretty simple. 
you had to have the Rio launch the uh, or push the button to uh, start the built-in check computers that set up some systems for for operation. So there was one F-14 early in the test program that was configured so the pilot could launch that check routine from the front seat. So, okay, uh, not right now. Okay, next. Oh, the F-14s. Uh, the F-14 was, um, uh, there, there are people that throw out numbers like that, but there are also a lot of squadrons that did uh, tracking. And, uh, and I, did, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I did some research, and it really is not as bad as some people said. And during, it, was a, it was a challenging airplane. It was complex, and pretty soon, you know, after 20, 25 years, it was starting to get old. And unfortunately, the Navy uh, was starting to reduce the number of airplanes in squadron, and so they let the manpower get reduced. And anyway, it was, it was a maintenance challenge, that's true, but it wasn't, it wasn't four hours of maintenance for every hour of flight time. Yes, Kish. Yes, I was flying F-14As. The A's, and uh, pretty, the uh, TF-30s were known to be a bit problematic at times. Yes. What was your most harrowing experience flying contacts? Okay, the I flew uh, F-14s with the TF-30s, which were, which which were, uh, you know, kind of a compromise engine. The later F-14 with a General Electric engine was much better, had more power and more reliability. So what was my most harrowing experience? And turns out my most harrowing experience was not engine related, but it was one time we were landing on the aircraft carrier uh, in the middle of the Indian Ocean and the cable wasn't set to the correct weight. So we landed on the carrier, we caught, the, we caught this one wire that wasn't set right and it slowed our plane down and then all the machinery uh, an arresting cable is as a bunch of hydraulic machinery and valves and stuff, and all the machinery broke because it wasn't set right. It was set for a 14,000 pound airplane, and we weighed, you know, 52,000 pounds. So we caught the cable, it slowed us down, and then it just paid out, and we went over the end of the flight deck about 50 miles an hour. And so, and we had, I mean, there was no indication, it, it was a normal landing. And then all of a sudden, it's like, this isn't normal. And this happened in about one second. And so the pilot, uh, the pilot was flying the airplane. We were very, we were a good crew. And he said, eject, eject. So I pulled my ejection handle and that rocketed both of our seats out of the airplane. And uh, the incredible thing was, I thought I pulled the handle at a good time you know, or I thought I did it in a timely manner, but there's one picture, oh, all right, there's one picture of the plane just before it goes over the end and you can see we're still in the airplane. So we came out of the plane as it was falling to the water. And then, so I went up, I came down in the water, splashed down, my parachute opened just before I hit the water and, and then I, uh, I got tangled up in my parachute that was pretty exciting. <laughs> the good things were it was daytime, the water was warm, and a helicopter showed up after a few minutes. Now there's, while I was tangled up in my parachute, I was trying to calmly back out like they taught us in Pensacola, but I was just getting more and more tangled up. So I had to cut myself out of my parachute using my switchblade. So I pulled my switchblade out and and this was, a, this was a credit to training. I didn't even have to think. I, all I thought was I needed my switchblade. You know, we had survival vests with radios, flares, and all. I, I knew exactly where my switchblade was. I just opened the pocket, pulled it out. And our equipment guys had trouble with the blades popping open, so they duct taped them closed. So I'm, I'm floating in the water, tangled in my parachute, using the end of my thumbnail, trying to find the end of the duct tape. So. <laughs> 
I found it. I found it. And, the, uh, and when I, I popped the blade open and when I cut, the blade was as sharp as could be. And I'm sitting there going, this is, this is what I needed. I needed a win right now. And uh, I, I, tell, I actually tell that story in more detail in my book, but it was, uh, it was harrowing. But the great thing was, as soon as I got out of the water, I mean, and as soon as we figured out everything, it's like, I'm good to go. I didn't have any lingering effects or... Oh, what was the investigation or paperwork? <laughs> the worst thing was, and this was in 1981. So the worst thing was uh, that they took us to medical and they took like five blood samples and seven urine samples or something, whatever it was. And so they were looking for something. You know, they wanted to make sure that people weren't on drugs, drinking, or whatever. And they did this. This was Navy standard, whether you ejected on a ship, on an airfield, or whatever. Uh, that, was, that was as bad as it was. And then we had to, we had to uh, there were a couple of investigations. We had to get interviewed by a, a Navy captain. We, uh, we had to write statements. There was a medical investigation. But yeah, it wasn't that bad. I was, I was happy to be alive and go through all that. So, the, and the helicopter guys told us, they said that uh, they go, Dave, when we pulled you up, we did not put a swimmer in the water. They go, we would normally put a swimmer in the water, but they go, we saw your parachute getting uh, tangled under the vortex of the ship, and we could see you were still in it. So they just lowered the uh, harness and dragged it over to me, and, and I grabbed the harness and they pulled me up. So I mean, it was it was pretty good. <laughs> yes. Just the dynamics. Do you come off the front end of the ship? Okay. So when you're ejecting, when you're landing on a carrier, where do you come off? Is the question. And the great thing was that is is that uh, modern carrier flight decks have the angle deck, right. and all landings go on the angle deck. Yeah. So I came off, and we were beside the ship instead of yeah, being in front of it. Off, you when you go yeah. take off, you can either go uh, from the front or the side. Yep. Okay, next. Selfies. Let me tell you a little bit about selfies. Uh, these were, okay, I already showed you one earlier selfie of me. This was another one. This was something that guys tried to do. Get a picture right off the catapult uh, so you could see the whole carrier. And, and speaking of lenses, this was probably another 50 or 55 millimeter lens. The F-14 had a big cockpit, but uh, your, the hard part was, you know, holding the camera up, especially back then, you know, a, a normal size single lens reflex. This was in an F-5, which didn't have a very big cockpit, but I think that was like a 35 millimeter lens or something, so a little bit of a wide angle. So I took a few selfies. I, I said we call them face shots. And then after thinking about it, <coughs> what's that? That's, the, very that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was in 1989. I was on deployment. We flew patrols. We had a lot of time. I had a lot of time to think. And after a while, I, I said, you know what? I know how to take a good selfie. So I, I wrote to, uh, I'll get closer to you. So I, I wrote to uh, Tamron, or one, one of those people that made inexpensive lenses, and I think I bought a 24 millimeter, something like that, 24, maybe 18, for like $50. And uh, then, this was the, this was the uh, hard part. I bought a small collapsible tripod, and I bought a vice grips. And I used uh, cable stays, zip, zip strips, you know, to zip ties to tie the vice grips to the tripod. And then I used the vice grips to clamp it to the pilot's ejection seat. <laughs> so, so this was sitting on top of my radar. And then I had, a, uh, I had like a six foot cable release that I had in my hand. And so I, I took, um, my, the pilot I was flying with, we did a whole roll we did a whole 360 degree roll, but when we're inverted, uh, I was in the shade and you can't see anything. You know, it's just, you can't even tell what it is. So this was, you know, this was good enough. And the mistake that I made, I mean, this is me. I took this picture and I sent it into the Tailhook magazine to, you know, just to show them, hey, we're reading your magazine out here on, the, on deployment. So one, I, 
you know, I didn't use the front cover of the magazine. I used the back cover, but you can, you can tell what it is, but not very well. But the biggest mistake I made was I didn't show my own name tag. And I'm going like, what? <laughs> anyway, that was so. And when I took that picture, I had no idea that, you know, it would be on the internet. And Yes? That is a rearview mirror. This this is a rearview mirror, and and the uh, <laughs> so so no MiG 28s can sneak up on you, right? So when when we use them in training, I mean almost all f fighters have them, but they're wide angle mirrors, and I I never got much use out of it. I think it's mostly useful for uh, especially for a pilot in a single seat airplane. Who wants to keep track of his wingman? He knows where he is, and he just wants to keep looking. But yeah, all all jets have rearview mirrors. Next, and then this this isn't a selfie, but this this is the only picture tonight that I did not take, and and uh, my buddy Russ Novak took it, and he he said I could use it. But when we were filming Top Gun, we went to a, a party at the end of the filming, <clears throat> and this is me and Tom Cruise. Uh, this is me over here. All right. <laughs> okay, this is my wife, Laura. Some of you have met her, and this is Tom Cruise, very young guy. And so when, when they told us that this party was going on, I told, I told Laura, I go, hey, let's, I want to go out and get some wacky shirt, you know, so I, at the party. So we went out, and I think I bought this at Target for, you know, $15 or something. So we show up, and the actors are wearing their leather jackets, you know, and I'm going, oh. but the, um, but, you know, all the Top Gun guys were there. Many, a lot of instructors were there. But we didn't wear our leather jackets to parties anyway because, I mean, we all had them. And it's like, you know, everybody's wearing your leather jacket. You're not going to impress anybody. <laughs> okay. Um, so when I retired, I was in, I retired from the Navy in 1999. I was driving home from work, and I thought I would write an article about uh, what it was about working on the movie Top Gun. And then after about a minute, I go, no, I need to write a book. And so I ran home, I, told, I drove home, I told Laura, she goes, oh, that sounds like a good idea. So I wrote this book, and uh, actually a couple of people in here have published books. If anyone, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, I'm just going to make a declaration. If you are thinking of writing a book, do it. Because finishing writing a book is a great feeling. Now, if you want to get your book published, that's another story. That's a whole other story. And, and these days, you can do very well with all the self-publishing and things like that. So you got a lot of options. So Top Gun Days, my first book, it was translated into Chinese and Japanese. Anybody in here speak Chinese or Japanese? Okay, this means like the new dream or something like that. So, and this is F-14. And, and those were legitimate translations, and I get royalties from China and Japan. And then uh, top, before Top Gun Days was the second book. Uh, and then I wasn't going to write a third book, but then I met a, uh, an editor who I really liked working with, and so I, I uh, wrote a third book, and it turned out to be my about my favorite one, and it's coming out in uh, May, May or June. And this is not a photograph. That's a, uh, that's a digital image that depicts a specific uh, story in the book. If watercolor painted F-14s. Because we, let's see. Oh, I didn't, I didn't put any of those pictures in here. Yes? Okay. Did you ever fire any of your weapons in? Oh, yeah. Did I ever fire weapons? Oh, yeah. I, in oh, in combat? No. No, I did not. Nope. I didn't shoot any in combat. My, uh, I do have some green ink in my logbook. That's the uh, combat time, but it was for uh, uh, Operation Southern Watch patrols. Now, and, I, and that's covered in this book. And I got to tell you, we showed up over there, and the, the uh, Iraqis were violating the no-fly zone because they knew what, you know, what was over there. And I'm going, well, we're bringing Phoenix over. And I go, we're going to surprise these guys. But they didn't violate the no-fly zone once we got there. So, I, you know, I thought, oh, we're going to get some, sh we're going to get some kills, but we didn't. Um, and the F-14 Phoenix, uh, the, the U.S. has no Phoenix kills with F-14s, even though they fired a few of them. Uh, now, 
in terms of training missile shoots, yeah, I shot uh, Sidewinder Sparrows and One Phoenix and the gun and stuff. And it's, it's cool. <clears throat> okay, next. Uh, so, Suresh, we're about on time, right? We're on schedule? Perfect. Okay. So we do have a couple of minutes to, uh, to answer questions. I'll take a couple of questions, but I don't want to take this too late. And then also, I will be here selling copies of Top Gun Days. I have copped, uh, Top Gun Days, $15 a copy. And if you have any, uh, if you want to read uh, some stories or see some of my pictures, uh, topgunbio.com has got them. This picture was taken at 41,000 feet. And we just... We, you know, that was, that was another one that's just unintentional when we noticed the, uh, the prismatic uh, reflection around the, uh, around the airplane. But once again, thank you for inviting me tonight. Thank you for having me. And my compliments to you on your enthusiasm. <laughs> oh, can I take one? If there's a question or it doesn't have to be. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so what's the role of the Rio in the in the in firing the missiles? Uh, and the references to the Libyan engagement, I don't know the guys involved in the Libyan engagement, but I've heard a lot of people talk about that one Rio, and they said he is a very aggressive person. And there's Rios that are like that. There were some Rios that were aggressive. There are some that were. So ideally, though, it's going to be the pilot and Rio working together to accomplish the mission. And and as I as I write in my book, you know, my pilot was listening to what I was doing, and when we were running the intercept, he would expect me to be running the show, and if I wasn't doing something right, you know, he'd, hey, Bio, what are you doing, or do you see this, or whatever, and I would do the same to him once we got in a dogfight, so it's uh, crew coordination, and uh, most guys bought into that and especially as time went on, uh, they, they, it was very professional and very capable. Uh, although I, there's you know a few people that, that did not like either being a pilot or a Rio, you know, whichever. There were just a few guys that that were unhappy, and I'm going like, well, oh, too bad for you, you know. Okay, one more question. Okay, that's that's a good question. Is there a medevac helicopter in the air for all carrier landings? And the answer is yes. Uh, they don't call it a medevac; they call it a plane guard. But its purpose is to retrieve the air crew, and it's it's a big investment. But the Navy has decided, you know, just like the Navy films all carrier takeoffs and landings, so. Th the you know the navy has decided to make this investment in terms of keeping the helicopter airborne for all flight operations yeah and you know it it pays off yes i don't think you mentioned where did the bio come from i know it's oh my call sign bio okay all right i'll tell that this will be my last one where does <clears throat> no yeah i i know uh sometimes i think on my website i wrote bio's bio so does bio you know my last name is Baronic, and it rhymes with bionic. And when I, when I started uh, flying, uh, when I started joining my F-14 squadron in 1980, 81, the $6 million man was, was fairly recent. And so the word bionic was you know, very familiar. So I was, they, they ask you, what do you want your call sign to be? So you know, some guys, they say, oh, I want to be shark, or I want to be killer. And they go, no, you're not going to be you know, killer, you're going to be meat or, you know, dirt bag or whatever. <laughs> so I show up with Bionic and, the, and this, uh, the guy that the pilot I was flying with, one, he goes, I'm not going to call you Bionic because I was 30 pounds less than I am now. So I was really skinny. And then two, Bionic did not sound good on the radio. It just doesn't sound good. So this guy shortened it to bio and that stuck. And I go, Good, you know, because there's a lot worse call signs. <laughs>